Hello and welcome to Tau Capes, the podcast that covers film, television, comics, and games. I'm your host, Cody Nestor. Alongside me is my co-host, Todd Hill. What's up, everybody? Uh, today are we are joined again by our special guest, Lexi Valentine. Hey, y'all. Hey, Lexi. It's good to have you back. Thank good, you. Good to see you, Lex. Uh, in addition to being a uh, part of the Tau Capes family, Lexi is literally family. And uh, we're happy you could join us again during the uh, Spooky Dookie season. Well, thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. Today we're talking about when evil lurks. In a remote village, two brothers find a demon-infected man just about to give birth to evil itself. They decide to get rid of the man, but merely succeed in spreading the chaos. When Evil Lurks was released in theaters on October 6th, after which it released on Shudder on October 27th. With a possible budget of $10 million, it has made 542000 at the time of the recording. Wow. Yeah. It has a Rotten Tomatoes score, though, of 99%. And an audience that. score fifty seven percent. So let's talk uh, talk non spoilers. So Todd, would you recommend people relax at home and watch when evil lurks on Shutter? I would recommend watching this. Yes, I would. Lexi, what about you? Should people pay for a month of Shutter just to watch when evil lurks? I say no. Ooh, controversy. <laughs> Ex- give me a little bit non spoilers. <laughs> but why would wh- Todd? Why do you say yes? Let's start with you first. Why do you say yes? Non spoilers. Uh, for me, uh, the way current horror has been tracking, this was like a breath of fresh air to me. I, I really like this movie. Okay. Lexi, counterpoint. I just feel like there was a lot going on. Like too much too going on? Too much going like on. Too much, too, much thrown, chaos. too much thrown at you at any one time? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So for me, <laughs> so uh, for me, the, uh, for the price of one month of Shudder, I would definitely recommend people watch this film. Uh, I enjoyed the setting and the premise. Uh, there were some moments that I saw coming and some moments that I didn't see coming. Uh, and even the moments I didn't see coming or I, I did see coming, they were kind of executed in a way that I didn't expect. You know, um, maybe some of the stuff that you're talking about, maybe that's kind of the chaos that's thrown at you. But, um, you know, when that happens, they're usually, you know, it's a very quick and very violent way that I wasn't kind of expecting kind of out of nowhere. Um, I would say this is more of a violent film than it is a gory film. Um, there is some gore, but it's not excessive, I would say. Right. Uh, would you guys agree with that? Yeah. More, fair, more, fair. more violent, less gory. I mean, this is not like a hostel or a martyrs or something like that. It's, it's definitely violent, but it's not overly gory. No. Uh, it's not a perfect film by any means, but it's a, uh, to me, it's a very so- uh, solid horror film. Uh, unless you can't read or hate subtitles, uh, <laughs> to me, when evil lurks is worth a watch. Uh, so that's it for non-spoilers. Uh, spoilers from here on out. But before we discuss the film in detail, it's time to play another round of how many stars. So, oh. yeah, I have eight audience reviews for you guys from when evil lurks right here. I'll read your review and you tell me from one to five how many stars you think the person gave the film. There are no half star reviews. Okay. Mm-hmm. I got to remember that. <laughs> yeah. I'm bad to forget exactly. that. Exactly. Lexi, you're up first. Okay. Okay. JP says, it had potential, but lost its grip on everything that made it interesting. How many stars? One. Two stars. Todd, Drew C. says, an absolute stunner. This is horror in every sense of the word. How many stars? I would say he gave it five. Five stars. Good I'm job. back, baby. <laughs> Lexi, Ethan says, solid kills throughout. Good to support a film with limited release. I enjoyed it. How many stars? I'm going to do a four. Four stars. Good job. One to one. Lynn says, could have been better, worth one watch, but never again. How many stars, Todd? I'm going to say she gave it two. Ooh, three stars. Dang, I was going to say three. (laughs) Uh, Lexi, uh, there was no name attached to this review, but they said, I don't know what all the praise about this movie was, but it was terrible. First of all, it's in Spanish and no English, so only captioning. Second, the acting was pretty lame, and it wasn't scary at all. It was pretty dumb. Stupid ended was really stupid. It didn't get it. <laughs> it didn't get it at all. I didn't get it at all, and people just couldn't wait to get out of the theater. Don't waste your money. It's a terrible flick. How many stars? That's definitely a one star. That's a one star. Wow. <laughs> Jimmy C says, "Do not believe the glowing reviews this garbage movie is getting. The only good thing about it is the closing credits because it meant that the movie was finished." Completely convoluted, nothing creepy or disturbing about it. The possessed, quote-unquote, dude looks like a white job of the hut that drools pus. 
<laughs> no, <laughs> nothing shocking or scary about it. There's no storyline, and you'll be wasting your time and money. It's not even worth watching uh, when it comes out on Shutter. How many stars, Todd? One. It's a, another one star. Lexi, uh, here's your last one. Vic W says, how are the audience scores so low? This movie was great, really enjoyed it, and will definitely be seeing it again. It's a must-see for horror movie fans, in my opinion. How many stars? Five. Five stars. Wow. Lexi. Todd, last one for you. Jeremy says, this was Jeremy Renner? No, oh no, no. Uh, this was one of the best horror movies I've ever seen, and I had to read subtitles the whole time. I don't speak a lick of Spanish, and there was no option for English dub. Uh, if there was, I'm an idiot and didn't see it. Awesome story, great acting. I really loved it, and I wish it was in English, but I can't take away anything for it uh, from it for that. Really great. Can't, uh, can't recommend it enough. How many stars? Got to be a five. Five stars. Yeah. Good job, guys. You did really good we did that good round. This time. Thank you. So now let's actually talk about when evil lurks. So, Todd, can you walk us through the opening of the film? So we're kind of just dropped right into this thing, which I love, by the way. <laughs> yeah, there's not a whole lot of setup or pretense to it. So we see two brothers, and they're venturing out into the woods to investigate a disturbance they had heard the night before. Uh, they come upon a dismembered body. Uh, they kind of travel over to an old lady's shack that's close by, and they discover that her oldest son has been possessed and is now what they call a rotten. Yeah, this oldest son, Uriel, uh, he's that what uh, that one guy called uh, a job of the hut drool, that drools pus. Right, right. That's, uh, that's our main possessed guy, the rotten, yeah. Which is basically a unborn demon that's looking to be birthed into our world. Yeah, so the the deceased man, we kind of learn a bit, little bit later, but they do kind of check his body, the one that was found in the woods. He's a what they what they call is a cleaner, and he had some kind of uh, kind of tools and things like that to kind of investigate and kind of find there with them. But yeah, basically, like you said, that we're kind of set up to we see our rotten. What do you think of the the effects of the rotten? How he it looked? was it was good, but it was nasty. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was. It definitely, you definitely kind of uh, get that set up and that, that first kind of little shock factor of like, ooh. I was going to eat during this movie, but no. I'm glad I didn't. Don't, you didn't yeah. have a snack. I would say for most people, don't don't <laughs> mm-hmm. don't be eating during this movie. Like, you, you're, you'll be good for a while, then all of a sudden, really quickly, you're not good, right. and then you go back for be good for a while, and then you're not good. No. Um, so, um, we see that the our main characters is, uh, is Pedro and Jimmy. Pedro is our main character, and Jimmy is his brother. Uh, they go to uh, the local kind of like sheriff's office, like the officials, to kind of tell them about, hey, there's a rotten, uh, you know, the the mom is like called the cleaner, the cleaner is dead, you know, the person that was kind of trying to come and kind of, I guess, exercise or find a way to actually kill him without releasing the demon, like you said. Um, and they kind of go in and talk to the cops, and they could really give a shit. Really yeah, they really do, they don't do anything, and Pedro, I guess, kind of has a history with them, so they kind of get into it a little bit, and then it just kind of goes nowhere. So um, they go from there to see Ruiz, the, the landowner. Yeah, yeah. So I guess um, he's the landowner. I guess that family, the mom, because it's the mom, Uriel, the rotten, and then she has another son who I don't think is named in the film. If it is, I don't remember. Yeah, so her her other oldest, I don't know if he's oldest, but the other son that we see, um, I guess they kind of rent and live on the land owned by Ruiz, and he thinks it's like a government thing to like kind of – drive down his land prices or forcing the to sell his land, those kind of things. And he wants to take kind of drastic measures right off the bat. But his kind of wife talks him down and Pedro and kind of Jimmy kind of talk him down um, at first, but then he decides like, we got to do something about the rotten. So they all kind of get together. They go and um, they go to his house. At first he's going to shoot him, which we'll talk about the rules about how to deal with rotten a little bit later. But they talk him into not shooting him, but they take and kind of uh, fold him up, or they try to, like, fold him up in some blankets and take him out of the house and then, like, pack him into the truck. And they're, like, fooling with him. And he's, like, falling out of the blanket, and he's, like, shit all over himself. <laughs> yeah. And it's, uh, yeah. It's that not a good... sheet was so weak with, like, shit and piss yeah. and his ribs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they could, could barely get him in the house. They get him outside. They throw him in the back of the pickup truck, and they drive him, like, I can't remember how far away, but – pretty good distance away and until uh they're like driving in the truck everything's going fine and then i guess ruiz isn't paying attention to the road and then like kind of swerves 
And in my mind, I was thinking, I was like, did, I was like, did they just throw that fucker out of the back of the truck? And they did. They did. They just threw the rotten over. He flies out of the truck somewhere. You don't see it, but he flies out of the truck and ends up in a ditch somewhere. You know, I didn't think about it at the time, but wasn't it like a kid in the road on a mm-hmm. bike they about hit? Yes. And then you find out later that kids are susceptible to that thing. I wonder if it, like, oh, had that's a that good kid point. wander out there and get it flung out. That's a good point. That That's something that's <laughs> talked about later is that kids – uh, kids love evil. Yeah. Uh, they're attracted to evil and they're susceptible to evil in this universe. Uh, um, but yeah, I didn't even think about that. That's a good call. Um, they, he flies out of the truck. The, the, the rotten does. They decide, Hey, we're far enough away. Let's just leave it here. What's the worst that could happen? Uh, and then we kind of go back to a little bit later, maybe it's even the next day and we hit, uh, the farm. So Ruiz's farm. So Todd, tell us what happens at the farm. So uh, Reeves' wife comes in and lets him know that one of their goats is now possessed. And so he grabs his shotgun. He's going to go out there and shoot it. She's like, no, no, you can't shoot it with a gun, which, you know, we'll find out later. It's one of the rules. And he kind of draws down on it, and that thing just walks right up to him and puts his head on that barrel like, shoot me, motherfucker. I thought that was (laughs) – because my first question about it was like, I was like, how does she know it's possessed? Like, what is it doing to act weird? Mm -hmm. And I just love that all the other ones scatter, and it's just like – yeah, there's only one left. Yeah, they just, they just and it leave. just walks right up to the shotgun. like. And said. I don't know if it kind of, you know, does something to his mind, but he blows his brains out. And as soon as he does, she puts a damn axe right now, on the side of his I knew head. the goat was going to get it. I knew yeah. the goat was done. But I didn't expect the wife to just, she gets the axe, because there's, I guess, wood being chopped nearby at some point, takes the axe, bam, right, right, right into Ruiz's head. head. But then... Doesn't stop there. As soon as he's chopped in the head and she goes all sling blade on him, mm-hmm. turns around and puts it in her own face, just like pa, pa, pa. That mm. had me yeah. shook. That I did not expect. Uh-uh. And I tell you, I've you know, watching horror movies, being a horror fan. And she I've was seen... pregnant, by the way. Sorry yeah. not to interrupt. She was no. pregnant. They were having a baby and uh uh, the the demon was kind of using that against him to kind of influence Ruiz mm-hmm. and everything else. But she was pregnant, by the way, as she's like chopping her. Not, so not only did, is it a murder-suicide, it's like a double homicide-suicide. She kills herself, kills her baby, killed her husband. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Like I say, you know, being a horror fan, I've seen, you know, people taking axes to the head, but I've never seen anybody mm-hmm. do it to themselves. And it's not just one. And it's kind of, yeah, it's, it's like, like at first, punk. it's like, okay, it's not hard enough kind of. I do it again. Punk. Bop. I might need either. Punk. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, that got me. I, I expected something to happen to him. I expected that that scene was going to go on a little bit longer. And she once she chopped him in the head, I'm like, all right, she, you know, whatever the rules of this universe, he's got to go because he was just stupid enough to, you know, to kill this goat. She's going to kill him. Or maybe it hopped from the goat right into her. But I didn't expect it to just immediately turn around and kill her, too. And that's one of the things that I like about this movie. Like, to Lexi's point, maybe something she didn't like about it, I love the chaos. Yeah, <laughs> the the just the randomness of everything that happens is just so kind of quick, and you just it jumps from one thing to one person to another, and it's like it just it's not about after anything. It really, unlike like The Exorcist, where the, the demon like there's a lot of like psychological stuff, and like right. there's a little bit of that in this film, but it's mostly just like let me, I'm gonna kill, I'm gonna eat, I'm gonna make somebody do something fucked up, and then that's it. Because it serves my ultimate goal. It's not really about messing with them so much or the psychological warfare. It's just like quick acts of random violence. Yeah, it's like, you know, where we're just kind of dropped into this thing and it's just it's just going. It's just mm-hmm. happening. If this had been like a Hollywood movie, there'd be tons of exposition. Oh, this is why this is happening. We got to see how this got into him, you know. Yeah. Yeah, but it's we, just it's just happening and shit's flying. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we do get a little little bit of exposition later that sets up the world, which more intrigues me more than it does like, oh, you know, like, well, you know, why do we have to learn about it? It was like, it was more intriguing the things we kind of learned about. Yeah, you get enough on the fly to let you know what's going on without boring the shit out of it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so from there, um. Pedro and Jimmy, they kind of uh, agree to kind of leave town. They want to get their family members. They want to escape to safety. So uh, they go. Jimmy gets uh, their mother, Pedro and his mother. Uh, Pedro goes to his ex-wife Sabrina's house. Uh, They got a little back-and-forth argument between them. Sabrina's kind of remarried. So Pedro and Sabrina have three children. They have the oldest, which is Jer. Um, I think I'm saying that right, but he's the oldest son. He's autistic. Uh, You have 
I'm not sure the ages of the other kids, but the two younger kids, there's a, a, a younger little girl and then there's a younger little boy. Uh, and they have been separated for, I think, four or six years, something like that. It's been quite a while. And from the conversation that they have between each other, it, it obviously didn't end well. <laughs> um, but also in the house, uh, you have Leo, her husband, Sabrina's new husband, and you also have the family dog. Yeah. So one thing, Pedro comes in the house and he uh, – he starts to strip off his clothes because he's got uh, rotten gunk and, you know, all that stuff from lifting and moving the rotten on him before. He strips off his clothes and just kind of leaves them in the floor, uh, which is, again, we'll see why not to do that or talk about why not to do that when we talk about our rules. But he strips off his clothes with all that rotten gunk all over it, and then the family dog kind of goes sniffing around and licking around. His clothes are on the floor. And, uh, Lexi, I know you love dogs. Yeah. Uh, tell us what happens with the family dog. All right, so um, he was sniffing the clothes, like you said, mm -hmm. and um, I guess the possession, evil, whatever, got into him. Mm -hmm. um, into the dog. He, yeah, into the dog. Mm -hmm. And then he proceeds to uh, attack the little girl um, and then drags her outside, and Leo was chasing the dog with the girl, um, and then eventually uh, Leo... Caught up with him and shot the dog. Yep. Yeah, shot Just the dog. like he he takes off at with a with a shotgun and takes mm -hmm. off in a vehicle looking for because the, the dog grabs her. You kind of see like a quick shot. He like grabs her by the neck. I think he's like shaking her under the table. Yeah. And that dog, it didn't look right to begin with. Even before it was possessed, <laughs> I knew that's a weird up. looking dog. Yeah. As soon as I seen it, I'm like, mm, something gonna happen with this dog. Right. He had these weird kind of bug eyes. Listen, I love right. dogs, but that dog was freaky looking. Yeah. Uh, and it just kind of added to, like, I was like, something's going to happen with this dog. Because you start seeing it too much, and you see mm -hmm. the little girl walking around and being next to it. And I'm like, something's going to happen with this dog. This dog's about to snatch this little girl. And he does, drags her outside. So uh, from the from Pedro bringing in those clothes, the dog kind of got possessed or was susceptible to it and uh, attacks the little girl. Like you said, Leo goes out and kills it. Pedro kind of runs after him, kind of following him and sees that happen to uh, uh, to him and then kind of just says, oh, well, fuck, let me go back to the house. I'm getting my kids. I'm getting out of here. He goes back. Him and his wife are kind of having an argument. He goes up and gets tries to get the one little boy ready, tries to get his oldest son out of bed, and uh, he goes and he kind of uses the oldest boy. He kind of like bribes him, I think, with some ice cream. Mm -hmm. Apple ice apple cream. Apple ice cream, yeah. yeah. He robs him with apple ice cream, the autistic uh, son, to kind of get him to show him where his mom's car keys are so that they can get in the car and get the fuck out of there. Mm -hmm. So they go into the garage, they get into the car, he's backing out of the driveway, and who, who comes around, Todd? Uh, that girl shows back up. Not a mark on The her. little girl, <laughs> yeah. The little girl who was just brutally attacked by the dog, she comes back, shows up, and uh, she starts to tell, she, she tells the mom that Leo is going to come home or something. and He's like, going to come back and kill her. Yeah. Right over, hit her. Yeah. <laughs> so, and that, there he comes. Leo comes back in because he's now the one that it shifted to, I guess, or has become susceptible to, uh, you know, the demon. And he just kind of flies in in the SUV and just flattens the mom and the little girl. Just runs the fuck out of both Flyles. of them. Uh, just, again... Did another moment I didn't see coming. Like, I figured they would just, he would back out and get out of there. The little girl was just there, and he would just look at her and be like, oh, fuck this. <laughs> I'm out. Yeah. I will say this movie does have a lot of good moments. You're like, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but, yeah, it just comes in in the car, just runs her down, and then we're just like left like, oh, what the fuck? And then we quickly go to Pedro, the two sons, Jimmy, and Grandma. In, uh, in the back of the old station wagon, just bobbing down the highway. Uh, and it's uh, it's through the grandmother that we kind of get some exposition and we kind of learn about more about how possession works in the universe. And then we learn that there are, she tells us six, but there are seven rules uh, about dealing with a possessed one. So the seven rules are don't use electric lights. Don't stay close to animals. The three of us would be dead immediately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My, uh, our dogs would immediately eat us. Yeah. Uh, don't have or take anything that was close to them. So that's what, uh, by Pedro bringing in his clothes, that's how the dog got susceptible to possession. Uh, don't hurt them. Never name the evil by its name. 
Um, so like the grandma was like listing off Beelzebub above and Azrael and like don't ever name the evil. Don't shoot them with firearms, which uh, that's what Leo did to the dog. That immediately kills the dog. Don't hurt it. Don't use firearms against it. Does that. And the last rule that we learn later in the film of the seven rules is don't be afraid of dying. If you're said than done. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, they're all in the car. And then um, we see there is a little scene where they kind of pull off on the side of the road. Um, and Pedro gets a call from Sabrina's phone, the wife that just got ran over by the husband. Um, and that's when you get a little bit of that psychological warfare because the she's on the phone possessed, obviously, and she's like, you took my kids. I'm coming for my children. You you never wanted them. Like, you know, basically, you know, I'm coming for your ass kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but they go, and I guess Jimmy kind of tells them about this girl that he used to work with or this woman he used to work with uh, named Myrta. And that maybe she can kind of help them out. So they go to her kind of like farmhouse. Uh, she is, we learned that she's a friend of Jimmy's, but she's also a former cleaner, uh, which we talked about before. That are, those are kind of the people that can come in and kill the demon in a way that doesn't birth it into the world, right? Um, so while they're there, I mean, it's a pretty good scene on the farm. I mean, you get a little bit more, um, you learn a little bit more about she's the first to kind of like, uh, through her kind of spot and talk about how uh, possession could work or works with autistic people. Um, so, like, from the moment they introduced Jer, like the autistic son, I was thinking, I wonder if they're going to, like, do something with him eventually with, like, him being possessed, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and of course, they did, and it was, like, it was handled well, I thought. Like, I thought that um, – element of the story had like a good setup and payoff for her kind of talking about it and talking about how they can be possessed, but it's like they don't, the demon can't figure out immediately how to work their mind. So it's not like a traditional kind of possession. Like I, I thought that was a great element. What about you guys? I thought so too. I agree. Um, so they're all kind of staying the night there. Um, and we get, uh, the grandma's kind of like sleeping upstairs with the the youngest son, mm -hmm. uh, and Sabrina, possessed Sabrina, makes her way to the farm and ends up uh, kidnapping the youngest son. Uh, and the grandma's just kind of completely freaked out. She took, I think she's like, "Oh, I took my sleeping pills," and <laughs> like, "Is that you, Sabrina?" Like, she doesn't, she never really believed Pedro and the M. She's never seen any of this happen. She's just kind of going on what they were saying and she's never seen it and she had re really no uh reason to su you know suspect Sabrina isn't you know just the mom and she's possessed or anything so she kind of sees what happens with Sabrina and then gets freaked out but Sabrina ends up um taking um the boy away and then so then we kind of get to we're getting close to basically our third act of the film here so Jimmy um Myrta tells him that he should go after the little boy and Sabrina. And then her and Pedro are going to go search for Uriel to try to find him and kind of end the plague before, you know, it can, you know, be birthed out into the world or whatever. Right. So uh, the scene with Jimmy, he eventually ends up finding uh, Sabrina and the little boy on the road. And that was the most disturbing scene to yeah. me. So she's just walking down the road. And he, you kind of see him coming forward towards camera, and he passes by her and kind of stops in front of her, and you see her walking to camera, and she is just nonchalantly walking down the road with the dead body of the little boy just plucking his brains out, pieces off of his head, and just eating him as she goes. Oof. That was fucked up. It was, <laughs> and it's just like, it's not even like, again, it's on the peripheral of it. It's not like... A straight up just that only thing in frame you've got Jimmy and it's just on the peripheral which makes it so much more creepy because it's just so nonchalant it was by far the most disturbing thing in the movie to me just this little dead boy just being eaten down the road Ugh. it's nasty <laughs> um but a question for you guys so what do you guys make of Sabrina uh so when they do the when he Jimmy ends up he gets pissed he obviously sees what's happened she's killed the boy he gets pissed and he crashes into her and crashes into her and then crashes into a tree in front of them and so she's kind of like crashed through the windshield and laying there and she says to Jimmy you told me you love me 
So I know she's possessed, and you know, again, we learned from the exorcist that the demons mix lies with the truth. So which scenario do you think is most likely? That Jimmy and Sabrina had an affair, that Jimmy just stepped in and Pedro, uh, after Pedro left his family and he and Sabrina developed a relationship after that, or do you think the demon is just lying? Todd, what do you think? I kind of think it may be maybe hitting on a possible affair that may have happened earlier. Uh, kind of seems like something she was kind of maybe saying to him to try to get some kind of sympathy, maybe preying on feelings he may have already had for her. Yeah. I don't know if I'm way off base, but that's kind of yeah. the way I took it. Lexi, what about you? Do you think it's an affair? Do you think it's he got close to her after Pedro left and kind of tried to step in and be like surrogate dad? Or do you think the demon is just fucking with him? I kind of agree with Todd, but I also kind of feel like it's the demon line. And like I said, uh, maybe it is a, bit, a mix. Because, I mean, that's kind of like how it was in The Exorcist. They mm, would Lies in the yeah. truth, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. It may either way kind of makes sense. You could kind of see, um, I lean more to maybe he stepped in or maybe he had like a secret kind of crush or whatever. Maybe he stepped in after since they still have kind of him and Pedro still have kind of a good relationship. But uh, there's definitely something going on there. And it's also kind of talked about or hinted in the movie like Pedro, in addition to like, he couldn't handle having an autistic son, and, like, I think he tried to, like, kill himself and maybe kill his kids, too, and that's obviously a big reason of why they're, you know, no longer together and separated and what he tried to do there. So there's, like, a lot of kind of little layers to it, but I just wanted to see what you guys think. I think there's room for interpretation there, but I think something was going on. I think seems like a little too intentional to just put in there. I think this movie kind of, like, from the other things that are said by the demon to people, like they all seem to kind of be true from what we see. So I think maybe they at least had something going on, whether it was an affair or after the fact, I think something was going on. Right. Um, so, uh, there's a really, another kind of really great scene that I thought. So after the scene with Jimmy, um, back at the Murta's house, grandma's still there by herself with Jair and then you start to see something ain't right with Jair. Myrta already told Pedro and Jimmy she thinks he's possessed already and that the demon is trying to fumble around in his mind and he's, you know, looking for a way to take him over and you just see him kind of like walk into the room or walk into the house and he just starts to talk to her just plain and normal as, as day. Like, you know, from that little creepy little scene that, y'all, yeah, oh, he's possessed. Yeah, yeah. something's up. Yeah, the demon has kind of figured out his mind. He's now speaking clearly and without any kind of impediment that he had before. Like, you know, he's mm -hmm. he's got possessed. Um, so while uh, Pedro and Myrta, they're out there driving her, uh, around, uh, we learn a little bit more about her backstory. She's kind of talking about what she did. Her and her husband were, uh, her husband was a shepherd. They had a church together. Uh, she said they were frauds, though, um, that a possessed person appeared in their church and that uh, the, the person, uh, she says that they puked all over them and they puked up the rest of the family that they'd eaten the night before. Uh, and she said, she goes on to say that God is dead and the times of churches is, uh, ended quickly and before mentioning the cobras. Uh, so what are the cobras, Todd? Do you remember? Uh, I believe they were monks that were able to teach the ways of destroying demons before they could be reborn. Yeah, exactly. She says that, you know, they kind of, it was a group of monks that kind of come in, they told them and taught them ways that they could go in and cleanse and, like Todd said, clean the demon and uh, take it out before, like, because you can't, can't hurt it normally, you can't use firearms against it, those kind of things. So um, Mertz and Pedro ends up at a schoolhouse, and it's full of what, Lexi? It's full of them kids. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck them kids. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's it's a schoolhouse filled with, like, uh, just possessed kids. Again, we talked about uh, kids love evil, apparently, in this yeah. universe. Kids are susceptible to evil. So it's got all these kids that are uh, lying to Pedro and her in order to kind of um, – they're kind of trying to keep them away from Uriel because they suspect that Uriel is there. Murta's like, they're lying to us. They're telling us to go here. If they tell us to go here, that means Uriel's body is here. Uh, so they're kind of like lying to them and kind of you're trying to exacerbate the whole demonic birth thing. So they end up going and finding under the, the is like a little auditorium and they go in and take up the planks. And at first it's just the dead bodies of the adults, I guess that had, they had lured there and killed like their family and, you know, parents and stuff. Then he's like digging around in the, in that and finds old pus field job at the hut. <laughs> uh, and so he goes and 
uh, Martha's trying to set up her cleaning equipment uh, to kind of do, I guess, her ritual. Uh, he's kind of like losing his patience, and the kids are coming in there and like, oh, you know, there's an axe. You can use an axe. It's in the other room. He goes to the other room. Don't fuck. Yeah, and Mercy is like, don't <laughs> leave me. Don't leave me alone. Like, why? And these, I mean, I understand it's a movie, and it's obviously written. As, why would you not listen to the lady that's done this before? Right. Like, you know these kids. You already know they're lying to you. And that's the whole point of this movie, really, is that your main your, your protagonist, it's about him making dumb decisions throughout mm-hmm. the whole movie. That's, like, the whole premise of it, really. But he goes, and he's like, goes to the axe that the kids told him and lied to him about. It's not no axe there, of course. <laughs> and then as soon as he steps out of the room, Merch is in the other room, getting mauled by the little children. So they kill her. Um, uh, he runs kind of away uh, to the office, like I said, to get the axe. They kill her. And he, they kind of trap him at first. And then he gets... Um, like a piece of equipment or something, I think. Of put maybe a piece of her cleaning equipment, isn't it? That's like she's using for a ritual. I think like that's kinda, what it was. Like a club thing. And he gets just he gets pissed off and he gets enraged and he just goes over to the Uriel and just starts beating him in the head with it. So he beats <laughs> the shit out of him and like there is a little part if you guys ever rewatch it, like I think there's like a little part with the effects where like I kind of saw on the top of Uriel's head it was like kind of like plasticky or whatever. Like just this one little piece, it just kind of moved weirdly. If you if you and you guys watch it, if, hopefully you you listen to this after you watch it. But it was just like a little wonky little piece, <laughs> like piece to his like head, uh, his head piece there. But yeah, he just kind of beats him to death with that. And then uh, what happens from there? Todd just releases releases. It was like a a child version. It was like a child comes up and they just him and the rest of the kids just sort of just walk on off. Yeah, like Uriel just kind of like it just kind of sheds its skin almost, and like a, a young kind of child again, evil and children kind of emerges from the body of Uriel and he's just like covered in blood and he kind of passes by Pedro and kind of it's like I think it's not on the poster but it's in like some of the promotional images where he kind of like wipes his forehead as he passes by him and leaves like these you know finger marks of blood on his head and you just kind of see um, that demon child that has been birthed kind of walk off with all the other little children just out to the field to do God God, knows what God knows what (laughs) at this point um So, Todd, I'll let you take it from here. Uh, Tell us how uh, When Evil Lurks ends. Uh, So they go back by, and they uh, pick up Jair, and they go back to uh, Pedro's house. And uh, his younger uh, brother goes out to the shed and is talking with uh, Uriel's younger brother. Yeah, the one we don't know his name. Right. Shed guy. Shed Shed, kid. We'll call him Shed kid. Yeah, Shed kid. (laughs) And uh, he actually confesses to being the one that killed the cleaner in the woods, and he actually says he killed his own mother. Yeah, he says that... uh, he, he heard voices in his head telling him to do something, so he went out and was, he was susceptible, went out and killed the cleaner so that it couldn't kill Uriel, killed his mom too. So that kind of wraps up that little storyline that was kind of, I thought it was going to be a loose end, but no, the shed kid killed yeah. his mom and uh, the cleaner. And he actually tells him that, uh, that their mother has suffered the same fate as well. And so we go flash into the house, and uh, Pedro's got his finally got his son that bowl of that apple ice cream. And yeah, they were, there was a scene <laughs> earlier where they were looking for it after some of this stuff was happening, and like, yeah, he never never got him the apple ice cream while they were on the road. And uh, he's just sitting there eating, and all of a sudden he just starts choking, and uh, Pedro goes over because he's just assuming it's like something normal for his kid's condition. He's just trying to took too big of a bite or whatever, and proceeds to discover like hair in his mouth and just starts pulling it out along with uh, his mother's necklace and yeah. uh, we realize that uh, Jair is indeed now a rotten and has eaten his own grandmother. Yeah, yeah, he was left alone with his, his, his grandmother. He, uh, he ends up eating her. Yeah, I mean, again, I wasn't expecting it. I didn't know what I was expecting that scene to be, but I didn't expect him to just start pulling out those clumps of hair out of the boy's mouth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know how rough it is when you just get one hair anywhere I mean, near your mouth. Whole, whole <laughs> clumps and whole strands. And then it's her necklace. And he's just, I think at that point, it's just the grief and having lost everything. Uh, you know, he lost everybody but his brother. He just kind of goes out and he just hits his knees and he's just. 
He's just emotional. He's yeah. a he's a wreck. He's yeah. He's 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 mad. He's hurt. He's angry. He's just yelling, and then that's that's pretty much the end of the film. Roll just, credits, baby. It just ends on <laughs> this very. It's it's a not so happy ending. You know, everything doesn't have to have have to have a happy ending, and this definitely doesn't have a happy ending because yeah. again, he's lost almost everything, and like every decision he made through the entire movie was. Not the right, maybe it wasn't the right decision, or maybe it wasn't the wrong decision, but it definitely wasn't the right decision. That's right. And it's just kind of everything just kind of leads him to that point. Um, so first question So, what were your thoughts right after you finished watching the film, Todd? Uh, I was like, you know, this was first of all, this would have been a film that if you hadn't said, Hey, we're going to watch this and talk about it on the pod, I, I would have never even picked it up. Yeah, and this is an example of. <laughs> I heard um, not word of mouth, but like things online. Um, I saw some really positive reviews. Obviously, critics are really positive on the film. We saw the Rotten Tomatoes ninety nine percent. Audience very divided. Obviously, between three of us, we have three kind of you know maybe two similar and one not so similar right. opinion to like the quality of the film. But like I just I saw it because it was getting such positive kind of feedback. It. it Debuted at a film festival, got a limited release. It wasn't anywhere around us. I'm like, hey, this is coming to Shutter. We need something for Spooky Dookie season. Let's check this out. <laughs> and I like to say, uh, nothing against foreign films or films with subtitles, but it's just something that I, I normally wouldn't watch. And uh, at first, when I started up, I was like, geez, that's not English. <laughs> <laughs> it is not English. <laughs> but right? I was like, well, let's keep going. And then things started happening. And Things started happening, and I was like, where is this going? This is gross. Oh, my God, look at that. And I'm, I'm glad I watched it. I really am glad I watched it. Lexi, what about you? Like, as soon as you the credits rolled and you cut it off, what, what was your first, uh, you know, thoughts or impressions? Uh, I was glad it was over. <laughs> <laughs> because you didn't like it so much or just because, like, it was unsettling or disturbing to you? Well, both. Um I mean, I didn't like it. Like I said, it was too chaotic. Too much was going on. I I don't like that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, there was a lot of things in there that I, I was kind of got nauseous a little bit. I ain't going to lie. Right, right. Uh, but one thing that I did notice um, was that this movie wasn't like other demonic movies uh, where it was based around uh, like re religion. Um, that's true. I mean, yeah. the, they, the only really mention of religion was when Murta says, you know, God is dead and the church has kind of failed, but it's not specifically like we never, that's another thing. We never see the, the cleaning ritual or the cleansing ritual. So we don't know if it's religion based or not. And I agree with you. I think that's a good thing to not to have to, because that's a problem with the new exorcist we saw because yeah. back in the day, the old exorcist was Catholicism and that was, you know, one of the predominant the kind of religion of that movie, and then you get an exorcist believer, and it's like, well, you've got to be politically correct. You've got to have Catholicism and this and all, you know, so that's a good point. Yeah, I did like that it wasn't based on religion. I feel like a lot of, you know, demonic movies are solely based on religion, and yeah. it was nice to have something that was not based on that. Absolutely. Uh, and that so, may yeah. have something to do with me enjoying it as much as I did because us coming off of just – watching Exorcist yeah. Believer recently, and I think we can both agree we all three hated that. <laughs> <laughs> this was like the, the fresh take it had on possession and, you know, the rules, and mm -hmm. I, I liked it. Yeah. Um, do you, I talked before about my most disturbing scene. It was the kid and, and the mom going down the, the, the road, but do you have a most disturbing scene, Lexi? Probably whenever uh, Leo crushed Sabrina and... The little girl against the... I was... Ugh. Just ran him over. Yeah. Fair. Uh, what about you, Todd? Most disturbing scene? Uh, man, for me, it's close between that dog attack and the uh, little boy head scooping. <laughs> yeah. They are equally... I didn't see that dog one coming. I was like, you know, I saw him sniffing the clothes, and I'm like, you know, this is going to play out, but I didn't think it was going to be that soon. I thought they were going to take the dog with them, and it may attack him right. in the car or... But, you know, he's just sitting there beside that girl. And next thing I know, it's just like, ow. Oh. <laughs> hey, well, absolutely. I mean, I was, again, there was a lot of, uh, you know, disturbing kind of scenes. Like I said, I, for me, it's the uh, it's the mom and the kid, uh, you know, the eat, eating uh, the kid and scooping, scooping out his brain. Yeah. Out. Uh, so let's move on to final thoughts and uh, review scores. So uh, we rank films on a 1 to 10 scale. 
Uh, starting from one, the ranks are uh, torture. Two is awful. Three is bad. Four is subpar. Five is decent. Si- or five is mediocre. Excuse me. Six is decent. Seven is good. Eight is great. Nine is amazing, and ten is a masterpiece. So, Todd, give us your final thoughts if you have any, and review score for when evil lurks. Uh, for me, yeah, this is a great and prime example of why it's good to sometimes get out of your personal comfort zone and try new things. Because I think, as I hit it on earlier, this is probably something I would have never watched on my own. Uh, you know, foreign film subtitles scrolling on. <laughs> but I knew Todd we, don't read. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> Toddy H, H don't read. I don't like reading my movies. <laughs> I want to watch it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we was going to do it for the pod, so I was like, well, you know, I, I've got, I'm going to watch it. And I am really glad I did because I gave this movie a score of eight. I thought it was great. Okay. Lexi, uh, final thoughts, uh, if you have them, and review score for When Evil Lurks. Uh, there were a lot of um, good moments, what the fuck moments, mm-hmm. um, uh, had me. I, I never could guess what was going to happen next. Uh, I would not watch it again, uh, but I do give it a rating of five mediocre. Okay, get out. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. I'm just kidding. Come on. <laughs> uh, so for me, uh, When Evil Lurks is the best horror film I've seen this year. And to be fair, I haven't seen a great number of them. I've seen maybe, you know, half a dozen or so of the kind of things that were just made in 2023. Uh, it's violent, sadistic, and it delivers some unsettling moments that you'll be thinking about, I think, once the movie is over. It's not flawless. It's definitely not a masterpiece. It's it's an average story that is kind of elevated by a filmmaker that I think understands this genre. Uh, we don't get to see how the world functions when demonic possession is kind of commonplace, but it's a concept that I'd be open for kind of exploring in future films kind of set in the universe. I don't want to go full, like, I don't need to know full how the sausage is made or how <laughs> Anakin became Darth Vader levels of it. But like you said, you don't see a lot of, like, what else is going on in the world. You just kind of dropped into it, which I love. But I would like to see how it's dealt with throughout because one of the big premises of the movie is that it doesn't really happen out in the country like this is. And it's, like, more in the city kind of thing. Like, I would like to see some more things explored in this universe, I'd be up for it. Yeah. Uh, but for me, I give When Evil Lurks an 8 out of 10, which ranks it as great. So, Todd, tell everyone how they can find us and stay up to date with us on social media. Uh, we are at Tal Capes on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Tal Capes Podcast on Facebook. You can also email us at talcapespod at gmail.com. Also, if you're so obliged, leaving us a five-star review on your podcast app of choice really helps the show. Be on the lookout for this week's Popcorn Mumbles, where we'll be talking about the 1998 film Halloween H2O. Uh, Tile Capes will return next week. We want to thank you so much for listening. Until next time, bye, guys. See ya. Bye, y'all.